Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. So, in this lecture we will discuss about polynomials over fields and Lagrange's interpolation. So, what are polynomials over a field? Imagine you are given a field f with the abstract plus and a dot operation, then a t degree polynomial over this field will have the form as follows. So, it will have t plus 1 coefficients and all this plus and dot operations are the plus and the dot operations of your finite field. Okay. Oh, well, the field need not be finite, it could be an infinite field. So, all this plus and the dot operations are the uh, field operations. So, for instance, if we consider the field Z7, uh, where the operations are addition modulo 7 and multiplication modulo 7, then <coughs> consider this polynomial f of x, where the coefficients are 6, 2 and 3. So, the set Z7 will have the elements 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Then if you want to find out the value of uh, the polynomial at x equal to 1, then f of 1 will be the summation of 6, 2 and 3 and since all the summation and multiplication operations, all the addition and the multiplication operations are done modulo 7, the result will be 4. If we want to compute the value of this polynomial at x equal to 8, then there are two ways to do that. Either we can substitute the value of x equal to 8, solve and finally do mod 7, that will give us the answer. But what we can do is that the element 8 in this field will be same as the element 1, because 8 will be same as 8 modulo 7 in this field which will be the element 1. So, the value of the polynomial at x equal to 8 will be the same as the value of the polynomial at x equal to 1 and we have already calculated the value of the polynomial at x equal to 1. Next we want to define the root of a polynomial over the field. So, an element v from the field is called the root of the polynomial if the value of the polynomial at that element v or x equal to v turns out to be the additive identity element. So, this 0 is the additive identity element ok. So, for instance, if we take again the same polynomial f of x, then it has only one root namely the value x equal to 6 is the root. Whereas, if we take this polynomial g of x, then it has 4 roots namely x equal to 0, x equal to 1, x equal to 2 and x equal to 3 all turns out to be the root. The next thing that we want to discuss is the Lagrange's polynomial interpolation. So, before uh, going through the statement, uh, we know that if we are given d plus 1 or more distinct points in a two dimensional plane on a two dimensional plane, then there is a unique d degree polynomial passing through them, passing through all the d plus 1 points. But if you are given d or less number of distinct point, then we cannot find a unique polynomial passing through all the given points. But d plus 1 or more distinct points are given, then we can always compute a unique d degree polynomial passing through those given points. So, the Lagrange polynomial interpolation extends that result for the case when your polynomial is over a field. So, the statement of the theorem is as follows, you are given d plus 1 distinct points and 
why they are distinct because the x components of these points are distinct. Then the statement says that there exists a unique polynomial f of x whose degree is d and which passes through this given d plus 1 points. And the idea behind the proof of this theorem is that given such d plus 1 distinct points we can compute the unknown d degree f of x polynomial. To compute that unknown polynomial the idea is to express that unknown polynomial as a linear combination of some d degree polynomials specifically d plus 1 number of d degree polynomials using the combiners y1, y2, yi, y sub d plus 1. Now, what are these d degree polynomials delta 1, delta 2, delta sub d plus 1? Well, if we take the first polynomial delta sub 1 x, then the value of that polynomial at x 1 will be 1 and the value of that polynomial at the remaining x values will be 0. So, basically every x i except x 1 is the root of delta 1 x polynomial. In the same way if I consider the ith delta polynomial namely delta sub i then all the x values among these d plus 1 x values except the value x i will be the root of that polynomial. And like that if I consider the d plus 1 th delta polynomial then all the x values in this set x 1 to x d plus 1 will be the root of this polynomial except x sub d plus 1. Okay. At x sub d plus 1 the value of the polynomial should be 1. So, for the moment assume we have such polynomials delta sub 1, delta sub 2, delta sub d plus 1 then it is easy to see that our unknown f of x polynomial will be this. Because indeed if we have this uh, system of polynomials delta 1, delta 2, delta sub d plus 1 and then if I evaluate this polynomial at x equal to x i then delta 1 evaluated at x i will turn out to be 0, delta 2 evaluated at x i will turn out to 0. So, we will have 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, but when we go to this ith term then delta i polynomial evaluated at x i will be 1 and 1 multiplied with y i will be y i because 1 is the multiplicative identity element and then again all the remaining other terms will be 0, 0, 0 and hence f of x i is indeed y i. And it is easy to see that the degree of f of x is d because it is a summation of several d degree polynomials. So, now the question is what will be the form of the delta i polynomial. So, if we want the delta i polynomial to have these two properties namely the value of that polynomial should be 1 at x equal to x i and all other x values in the set x 1 to x sub d plus 1 except x i should be the root then this should be the delta i polynomial. So, you can see x 1 is the root, x 2 is the root, x sub i minus 1 is the root, x sub i plus 1 is a root, x sub d plus 1 is a root. The only term which is missing in the numerator is x minus x sub i that is not there. Okay. Now, let us see some more properties of t degree polynomials which will be useful for us. So, let me denote the set of all t degree polynomials over a field with s being the constant term by this notation fancy p superscript s t and any polynomial in this set will consist of t plus 1 coefficients where the constant term or the coefficient for the constant term is fixed it is s. But a 1 could be any element from the field, a 2 could be any element from the field and a sub t could be any element from the field. 
So, it is easy to see that the number of such polynomials is nothing but the cardinality of field raised to the power t because a 1 we have cardinality of f number of options because these many candidate a 1 coefficients we could have and independent of a 1 the number of candidate a 2 coefficients also is cardinality of f and so on. right? So, if you want to see an example take this field f okay, and suppose t is equal to 2 and s is equal to 1. So, what will be the set of all possible 2 degree polynomials whose constant term is 1? Well, that set is this. So, you can imagine, so this constant term 1 can be treated as a 2 degree polynomial because I can treat this polynomial as the constant term being 1, then the coefficient of x power 1 is 0 and the coefficient of x square is 0. In the same way, uh, the polynomial 1 plus x square can be interpreted as a polynomial where the coefficient of x power 1 is 0 and the coefficient of x square is 1 and so on and the constant term is fixed. So, you see the constant term is fixed to 1 and the degree does not go beyond 2. So, this will be the collection of polynomials and all the coefficients are from the set z 3 which will have the elements 0, 1 and 2. Okay. <coughs> now, the next result is the following which is again a very standard result. So, if you take a two dimensional plane and if I give you one point on the straight line and now if I ask you how many straight lines I can have passing through this circled point whose constant term is s, there is only one straight line. If I ask you how many straight lines I can have passing through the circled point whose constant term is s prime again there is only one straight line. If I ask you how many straight lines I can have passing through this circled point whose constant term is s double prime again there is only one straight line. So, we can extend that result for the case of finite field for any degree polynomial. So, imagine you are given t distinct points, t arbitrary distinct points. why they are distinct because the x components are all distinct and all of all the x components are non zero then the claim is that you take any value from the field there is only a single t degree polynomial whose constant term will be s and which passes through the given t points so pictorially i am fixing the t points where all the t points are distinct and now I am asking how many polynomials of degree t can be there whose constant term is s and which passes through these t points well there can be only one such polynomial because that polynomial has to pass through 0 s as well namely the point 0 s lies on that polynomial and anyhow I am giving you t more points also to lie on that polynomial. So, all together all together we have t plus 1 points and through t plus 1 points we can have only 1 t degree polynomial passing. In the same way if I ask you how many polynomials can be there whose degree is t whose constant term is say s prime and which passes through this fixed given t points the answer is there is only one such polynomial say g of x. Okay. Now, based on these properties of t degree polynomials, let us see an experiment which is a randomized experiment. It is a randomized experiment in the sense that even if the input of the experiment is same, the output could be different with different probabilities. So, the input is a value from the field. Now, to generate the output uh, the experiment picks a random t degree polynomial. So, 
a random t degree polynomial with s as constant term. And then to generate the output, it evaluates that polynomial at n publicly known distinct points. So, f is computed at alpha 1, f is computed at alpha 2, f is computed at alpha n, where all these alpha components are distinct, different from 0 and that is the output for this experiment. So, you can see why this is a randomized experiment. If I run this experiment 2 times, again uh, if I run it 2 times with the same input s, then the outputs y 1 to y n will be different with different probabilities because the outputs are the points on the polynomial which is selected here randomly. So, the probability that the polynomial turns out to be the same during both the invocations of this experiment is small. Okay. It is of course, non-zero, but it is small. assuming that your field is sufficiently large. So, <coughs> pictorially the output of the experiment is select determined as follows. The input is fixed to generate the output a random curve is picked whose constant term is s and the value of that and n points on that curve are given as the output. Again, if you want to run the experiment with input s, next time probably you would have chosen the polynomial f prime x and then the outputs would have been different. Huh. The alpha components remain the same throughout the experiment. Okay. So, the alpha components does not change, it is fixed once for all and it will be publicly known. Now, we want to analyze here that how much information about the input s is learnt through any subset of t output values. So, what I am asking here is the following. Suppose, you can see only t output values in this experiment. You do not know the value of s, but you know the steps of the experiment. You know that I would have picked a random polynomial whose degree would have been t and whose constant term would have been my input and I would have given you t output values because you can see only t output values not the full vector of n values. Now, the question is how much information about my input you learn in this experiment. So, pictorially I am asking you the following question. So, imagine that you observe the first t output values. Now, based on those t output values and anyhow the components alpha 1 to alpha t are also known to you, can you tell whether my input was s 1 or my input was s 2 or whether my input was any other value from the field. The claim is the following, with equal probability the t output values could result for the input being s as well as the input being s prime. More specifically, if we consider an instance of this experiment where the input would have been s and if we consider another instance of the same experiment where input would have been s prime, then with equal probability you would have seen the values y 1 to y t as the first t output values. That is the claim here. So, formally if we take the probability over all possible t degree polynomials f of x which are randomly selected from this set, the probability that the randomly chosen polynomial from this set evaluates to y 1, y 2, y sub t at alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha sub t is equal to 1 over the size of the number of t degree polynomials with s being the constant term. This is because when we are taking the probability over all candidate f of x polynomial, there is only one f of x polynomial which 
in this bigger set of all t degree polynomials with s being the constant term such that that polynomial evaluated at alpha 1 would have given you y 1, that polynomial evaluated at alpha 2 would have given you y 2 and that polynomial evaluated at alpha t would have given you y t. This is because alpha 1 y 1 alpha 2 y 2 and like that alpha t y t it constitutes t points and that point do those t points along with 0 s determines a unique t degree polynomial. So, among all possible polynomials from this set of polynomials there is exactly one f of x polynomial which satisfies this condition. For all other f of x polynomials in this set the condition will not be satisfied. Okay. Now, what is the probability that in this experiment indeed that specific polynomial f of x is selected here. Remember the polynomial from the set is picked randomly. So, among all the polynomials with degree t and s being the constant term the probability that experiment would have selected that special polynomial f of x whose constant term is s and which evaluates to y 1, y 2, y t at alpha 1 to alpha t is 1 over the sample space. The sample space is the set of all such polynomials and the favorable element or the favorable number of polynomials is only one polynomial. And now due to the same reason we can argue that if we now take the probability over the set of all t degree polynomials selected randomly whose constant term being s prime the probability that any such randomly chosen polynomial would have evaluated to y sub 1, y sub 2, y sub t is also the same as 1 over the number of t degree polynomials with s prime being the constant term. But if you see closely the number of t degree polynomials with s being the constant term and the number of t degree polynomials with s prime being the constant term is same namely 1 over field size raised to power t. So, that shows the following that that shows that if there is an observer who observes or who learns the output of this experiment for any subset of uh, it learns only a subset of t output values instead of the full n output values. Okay. Then from the viewpoint of that observer the probability distribution of those t output values it does not depend on s. Those t output values could occur as the output of the experiment for s with the same probability with which those output values would have occurred as the output if s prime would have been the in input of the experiment. So, let me demonstrate this with an example to make it more clear. So, let us take uh, specific values for n t and a concrete field and the concrete value of the candidate secret or candidate s. The s here is called as the secret. So, imagine the value of s is 13 that means someone runs this experiment with the input 13. Now, there are many polynomials of degree 2 with 13 being the constant term specifically uh, there are 17 square number of such polynomials. Okay. Among all such polynomials one such polynomial is picked randomly in the experiment. Okay. So, suppose we also fix the evaluation points alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5 to 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 respectively. Now, so, as I said that the polynomial f of x is picked randomly suppose in the experiment this polynomial is selected. The probability that this polynomial is selected is 1 over 17 square. 
because as I said there are 17 square candidate polynomials. So, the probability that this polynomial is selected is 1 over 17 square. Now, if the experiment would have selected this polynomial then the output would have been the out value of this polynomial at x equal to 1, x equal to 2, x equal to 3, x equal to 4, x equal to 5. Now, suppose I do not give you the 5 output values, but I give you only 2 output values say and those 2 output values could be depending upon your choice. You just ask me 2 output values. So, suppose you asked for the first and the third output value. So, I give you y 1 equal to 8 and y 3 equal to 10 and now I ask you can you tell me what was my input? My input was 13 can you tell me what was my input? I will now show you that the following hold from your viewpoint you know that my input is an element from this field z 17. That means, from your viewpoint the candidate s could be 0, it could be 1, it could be 2 or it could be the element 16 as well. And I am challenging you please tell me what was my input. I will and given that you have seen the output values y 1 equal to 8 and y 3 equal to 10 and of course, you know all the alphas that also you know and you know the steps of my experiment as well. I will show that for every candidate value of y every candidate value of s right and as and as I have said that there are 17 candidate values of s you cannot rule out any of them. With equal probability it could be the case that I have run the experiment with input 0 and if I would have run the experiment with input 0 I could have produced the outputs y 1 equal to 8 and y 3 equal to 10 and given to you. And with the same probability it could be the it will be the case that I could have run my experiment with input 1 and produce the outputs y 1 equal to 8 and y 3 equal to 10. And like that with the same probability it will be the case that I could have run my in input uh, I could I could have run the experiment with input 16 and produce the outputs y 1 equal to 8 and y 3 equal to 10. So, let us see. So, now this computation you are doing in your mind because your goal is to find out what exactly was my input. So, you think your mind you are doing this mental calculation is it possible that professors input is 0? Well, there is a probability that professors input is 0 provided he would have selected the polynomial 16 x plus 9 x square because indeed this candidate polynomial when evaluated at alpha 1 would have given 8 and when evaluated at alpha 3 would have given 10 which matches with the output values that the professor has given you. So, you cannot rule out the candidate 0 from your viewpoint. Now, you are asking the following question is it possible that professor has run the experiment with input 1 and answer is yes it is quite possible that the professor has run the experiment with input 1 provided he has selected this polynomial. That means, if professor's input would have been 1 and if he would have selected this polynomial and then if he would have evaluated this polynomial at alpha 1 and alpha 3 you would have seen the outputs 8 and 10. And like that there is a possibility that the professor has run the experiment with input 2 where his polynomial was this value and this polynomial evaluated at alpha 1 and alpha 3 would have given the outputs a 10 t as you have observed. And now like this I can complete the table and then you can see what is happening here is this is the computation which you have done and you cannot rule out any value any candidate value of s you have seen outputs 8 and 10 you do not know the polynomial that I have selected you do not know my input and now you have done a mental calculation and your as per your mental calculation every candidate s could have resulted in an output y 1 equal to 8 and y 3 equal to 10 in this experiment and that is why 
just seeing the two values namely y1 equal to 8 and y3 equal to 10 is incomplete for you is insufficient for you to determine what exactly was my input in this experiment. Okay. So, this is a very nice property which we will utilize later on heavily in the course. So, with that I end this lecture. Thank you.